Hello, and welcome to the fourth video in this series of God's Roadmap to the End. I'd like to start a series today that will look at the events that I believe the Bible shows us occurring, when the sign of Revelation 12 is fulfilled. I have found that the information about the time and events that are marked by this sign, probably require the most intense study of all, in order to complete the picture that the Bible offers, and for us to understand this period of time correctly. There is so much information to consider, that I will have to split this into a number of sections, so that we can spend enough time, on each section and perspective, to cover all the detail. In part 1 of this series, we will establish some positioning, around the timing of events, that occur during the final week of years, given by Gabriel's prophecy to Daniel. Without a proper understanding of this seven-year period, also known as Jacob's Trouble, and how various passages fit together, to complete the picture drawn in God's Word, we end up establishing our understanding on isolated passages. This usually leads to various conclusions and divisive arguments. We can also choose to use our own interpretation of what God's Word says, instead of allowing the Bible to interpret itself. My aim with the first video in this series, is to build up a picture about this time, making use of various bits of information all forming part of God's Word that are tied together to illustrate a biblical view, that avoids contradiction. Once we have a general idea of the chronology described, we can then view this very important time, from various perspectives, and bring in additional detail from Scripture, further clarifying how this all fits together. There are various opposing viewpoints in the world about this yet future time, and the events that will take place. I am not claiming to know with 100% certainty, exactly how these will play out, but I believe that God's Word gives us a very good understanding of what to expect and how to accurately position, the events described in time. Without the complete picture, we arrive at different conclusions, that lead to senseless arguments, causing division. I believe that our viewpoints on the information that we consider in this book, depend on various aspects that work together, depending then on the approach that we adopt when we study the Bible, and how much of the Bible we consider when we draw a conclusion, we arrive at a specific understanding that conforms to our chosen approach. This approach could be that, of interpreting what is written as allegoric, symbolic, we could view scripture in a literal sense, or apply a combination of these. We could choose to focus only on certain sections of the Bible, for instance a focus on the New Testament, while ignoring what the Old Testament says, or a focus on the Old Testament only, as is the case with Israel, while rejecting the New Testament. I believe the only way to ensure that we obtain a reliable answer is to consider, as much as possible, of what we read in the entire Bible, before we draw a conclusion. I feel compelled to share with those who are interested, a viewpoint achieved by the same means in which the discovery of the celestial collision between Jupiter and Nibiru came about. My approach is a more literal, interpretation of God's Word. I focus on identifying patterns and subtle connections between passages, and then gather as much information about a specific subject, from other passages in the Bible to construct an image. I also aim to avoid an understanding that would result in a contradiction between passages of the Bible, allowing the Bible to interpret itself. With Bible applications, available to us today, this process has become very simple, compared to a few decades ago. I hope that what you will see and hear in this video today, will shine a new light on the time before us, by letting God's Word interpret itself. Having said that, please know that I have no desire to judge anybody, should your view differ from mine. All I ask is that you keep an open mind and test what I say against the Word of God, specifically when it comes to the avoidance of contradiction between passages in this book. I am simply offering a viewpoint, that I lay at your feet, for consideration, making use of the same approach that led to the discovery of Daniel's sealed up prophecy and vision. If you find that you disagree with some of the information that I will discuss today, please have patience until we have covered all the perspectives that will assist to substantiate what is said. There is more information coming and in the end, it will all fit together and make sense. So, what is September 23rd, 2017 all about, and what does God's Word show us about this date? 
what understanding can we obtain from the Bible about the Feast of Trumpets and the timing, as well as the order of events, surrounding this feast. In the previous videos, we have shown that the Revelation 12 sign is a very unique celestial signal that marks the completion of the Feast of Trumpets in 2017. This matches the methodology that God used, according to Genesis 1:14 and Leviticus 23, in which a three-hour long, solar eclipse marked the first feast day of the spring season, otherwise known as Passover. To understand this important period that will soon be at our doorstep, we will start our investigation by referring back to the prophecy in Daniel, where this important time directly ahead of us, is first mentioned. I believe it is very important to keep in mind how the two seasons of feasts, are aligned with this prophecy. In our studies we have to find connections to other passages that provide illuminating information, to assist us in understanding, exactly what will be happening, and where these events will be positioned, on the timeline that God's Word describes. This is then what we read in Daniel 9. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Know therefore and understand, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Gabriel mentions a total of seventy weeks, that were determined upon Israel. Sixty-nine of these weeks covered the time from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, until Israel's Messiah was revealed. This prophecy presents a pattern and precise timing to Daniel in advance, so that Israel would be in a position to count the years until the arrival of their Messiah. However, Israel failed at this task and as a result, were struck with partial blindness as seen in Luke 19, verse 42. Jesus then fulfilled the first four feast days, exactly on the days appointed for them. The completion of the first feast day of this season, was then marked by a very unusual solar eclipse. There is then a large gap between the last feast of the spring season and the first feast of the fall season. God's Word provides no evidence that Israel's Messiah, fulfilled any of the remaining feast days. This is yet future but based on the celestial signaling pattern associated with the feasts, we know exactly when the first feast day of the fall season will be fulfilled, we can even calculate the time of this to within an hour, based on the specific alignment given. It is very interesting that the two seasons of feasts, relate to the two calendars, given to Israel. One marks the beginning of months, starting with the month of Nisan, and the other calendar, the beginning of years, starting in the month of Tishri. The spring feasts are then associated with a calendar for months, while the fall feasts are associated with a calendar used, for determining years. Based on what we read in this passage, there is one week of years, or a seven-year period, remaining, with a yet future fulfillment. This seven-year period has three associated feast days, scheduled for fulfillment also by Israel's Messiah. God has given us assured knowledge about the future, Given the fact that we recognize the same celestial signaling pattern, observed during the spring feasts, also applied to the fall feasts. Gabriel specifically addresses the remaining week of years, and explains that it starts with a covenant, that a specific individual confirms with many. If you watched the third video in this series, you will know that the beginning of sorrows will precede the events that will take place on September 23, 2017. 
This time of increasing birth pounds and sorrows will prepare the world, for entering into a contract with this person, who will be presented as a savior to the world, intervening to prevent humanity from self-inflicted extinction. Gabriel provides no information to Daniel, about the period between the contract being established, and the midpoint of the seven-year period. The reason for this will become evident as we continue. Very important to note here, is that the next event described, references the midpoint of this seven-year period, involving an abomination and the cessation of sacrifices. This seven-year period, also known as Jacob's Trouble, consists of two parts of 3.5 years that we will consider in more detail in an upcoming video. Reading Daniel 9 in isolation, leads to various opinions about what exactly is happening here, as we can only obtain a partial view of the events described. This leaves us with more questions than answers, as I think you would agree with me at this point, that this passage, on its own, is somewhat cryptic. The information provided here, does not reveal to us exactly who it is that is referred to when verse 27 talks about he, we do not know what the abomination is, and, there is no information given, about the period, between the covenant being made, and the midpoint of this seven-year period. If at this point, we draw conclusions, about what this passage tells us, based on this information alone, you can imagine the variety of seemingly valid opinions. However, we are able to extract specific information from this passage, that connects to other passages, and we can then combine sets of information to obtain more clarity. In absence of the New Testament, it often happens that people confuse the identity of the Prince of the People, with Messiah the Prince, which we find in verse 25, and this, I believe, is why most of Israel believe that all of what is written in this passage in Daniel, concerns one person only, and that is their Messiah. Gabriel refers to the city and the sanctuary that will be destroyed, the end of which, is with a flood, and we have to establish whether this is talking about an event that already took place, or an event that is yet future. The fact that the sacrifice and oblation cease, at the midpoint of this seven-year period, tells us that specific events, will need to occur, in the time leading up to the midpoint, in order for sacrifices and oblations, to be made by Israel. We know that this week of years, specifically relate to Israel and forms part of the total of 70 weeks, and it is therefore, logical to understand Israel's involvement with the sacrifices and oblations mentioned by Gabriel. Since we have this critical event described right in the middle of this seven-year period, it further complicates matters as we now have two periods of exactly the same duration, leading up to, and also following, these midpoint events. Fortunately, we find several passages in the Bible that refer to these 3.5 year periods, providing us with additional information to understand both what it is that will happen, as well as where to position the information in relation to the midpoint. The Bible refers to the three and a half years, before and after this critical event, as 42 months, or time, times and half a time, or 1260 days. Before we continue to look at these two equal length periods, we need to obtain more information about what exactly Gabriel was referring to, when he mentioned the events, occurring at the middle of Jacob's trouble. So, let us begin this discovery, which I believe will reveal information to you, that you have never seen before, by starting with Daniel 9 as our point of departure. Where possible. I will approach the information provided from a literal perspective where I can prove that a literal interpretation is supported by the Bible. On this seven-year timeline known as Jacob's Trouble, we see this then being initiated with a contract between, the prince of the people that will come, and many. Focus is then shifted to three and a half years later, and a midpoint event is then depicted, involving the sacrificial system that will be interrupted. We also see abominations that will lead to destruction mentioned by Gabriel, this is the first piece of information, that we will connect to other sections in the Word, to enhance our understanding of what this means. Three chapters further, we find another passage in Daniel, relating to the same midpoint event, but this then continues past the end of this seven-year period. 
it confirms to us that the end of the daily sacrifice, coincides with the abomination being set up, that causes destruction, as we can see in the following verse. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. On to Matthew 24, where we find another reference that specifically links to this abomination. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. When Jesus refers to the prophecy in Daniel, we see that the abomination of desolation features in what is known as the holy place, adding a little more information to the description of this event. This was not revealed to Daniel. In addition, we see an instruction to Israel, or those who find themselves in Judea at the time, to flee into the mountains when they see this event occurring. We have to pause here and think about what this implies. If we look at what Jesus is saying here, we know that religious Israel rejects the New Testament as being part of God's Word, they only have the information provided in Daniel with regards to the abomination. Depending then on whether Israel's stance towards the New Testament has changed at this point in time, they would then either be unaware of this warning, or reject it, based on their view that the New Testament is not part of God's Word. We see then that only those who would recognize Yeshua as being the true Messiah, before this midpoint event occurs would find themselves in a position to escape the destruction that is inferred in Matthew. This fleeing action, that is described, links to and confirms what is written in Revelation 12, where we see the woman, clothed with the sun, with the moon at her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head, providing symbolism that clearly identifies the woman as Israel fleeing into the wilderness when 3.5 years remain. This is what we read in the two passages in Revelation 12. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. Adding this information to our discovery, we can see that Israel fleeing into the wilderness, now coincides with the cessation of the sacrificial system that will be reinstated and the abomination that causes desolation being set up in the holy place. When doing a word search on the holy place spoken of in Matthew 24, we see this referenced 60 times in the Bible referring either to the holy place, or to the most holy place. This space is in every instance always associated with God's temple in the Bible. As such, we already have an accurate interpretation by God's word for what this means. If we change the meaning given by God's word to anything else, we are deviating from the Bible's interpretation of itself. We know therefore that God's temple, that Israel currently desires to rebuild, will be rebuilt, during the first 3.5 years of Jacob's trouble. This rebuilt temple has been an outstanding requirement, over the past 2000 years, preventing Israel from reinstating the sacrificial system. Without a temple, Israel cannot sacrifice lawfully. We obtain even more information about this event from the following passage. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2 removes all doubt about the existence of the third temple during this seven-year period where we see the man of sin, or the son of perdition, setting himself up in the temple of God to be worshipped as God. Let us now combine this new information with what we have so far, using simple logic. For the man of sin to be worshipped as God in the temple, it requires the temple to exist, and to be complete. Daniel 9 verse 27 tells us that the temple activities end at the midpoint of Jacob's trouble.
In Matthew 24, Jesus describes an event that would require Israel to flee into the mountains. This escape to the mountains, also occurs at the midpoint of this period when we read Revelation 12, by understanding that Israel will flee into the wilderness when three and a half years remain. We know that the destruction described in Daniel 9 and in Matthew 24, relates to the information that we find in Revelation 12, where Israel escapes a flood when fleeing into the mountains. This flood in Revelation 12 is directly linked to the flood described in Daniel 9 26, and as you will see it is a very significant event, tying together a number of aspects that I will soon demonstrate. With the information that we have so far, I would like to address the belief of some who say that all of the prophecies in Daniel 9, have already been fulfilled. Many believe that the destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple in 70 AD, fulfilled the desolation events that are described in Daniel and other passages. This is where we have to verify what we believe against what is written in the Bible, to ensure that our viewpoints are completely supported by the Word of God, without leading to contradictions. Something that in my opinion, immediately causes a problem with this specific view, is the flood that we see in these two passages, accompanying the destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple. The fact that this flood is mentioned twice, once in Daniel 9:26 and again in Revelation 12, verse 14 to 16, indicate to me, that we are dealing with a literal flood, that is yet future, and not something that should be understood in a symbolic sense. It is true, that the Bible in some instances symbolizes armies, as floods, and I am not saying that a symbolic interpretation is not valid. What I would like to establish however, is confirmation that the Bible actually confirms a literal interpretation for this flood that is described. Let us see then, if the Bible provides supporting evidence for understanding this specific flood, as a body of water, that will wipe away Jerusalem and the Temple. The passage in Revelation, provides additional detail, linking this flood to another facet that is seldom considered, and this describes, what seems to be a geological event that will accompany the flood. It talks about the earth opening its mouth to help the remnant of Israel, that will at this point, in obedience to God's word, be fleeing from Jerusalem. The earth's mouth, that would be able to swallow up a flood, can only represent a large crevice, or a crack in the crust of the earth, that will drain away a surge of water, if we consider a literal application of what is described. This water would then most likely have to originate in the Mediterranean Sea. What would then be the cause of something like this? According to Revelation 12's description of this event, this rip in the Earth's crust, will form at the same time as the flood, based on the description of the passage in Revelation 12. Considering the information that we have covered in the previous videos, and the fact that Revelation 12 has a celestial connotation, this event, in my opinion, represents a very specific encounter between the Earth, and the debris, caused by the collision between Jupiter and Nibiru. Something that could cause a large rip in the crust of the Earth, that would be associated with a flood, is an asteroid impacting the Earth, in an ocean, with such force that it cracks open the crust of the Earth. If a large asteroid impacts the Earth, at a speed of several miles per second, it would be easy to see how this could penetrate the crust of the Earth and split it open while at the same time causing a massive tsunami. A crack that is formed like this, will cause tremendous devastation in its vicinity, considering the amount of seawater that will drain into this crack and come into contact with the molten insides of the earth. The explosive force that will result from this event, will be unimaginable and will be something this world has never seen. The fact that a massive tsunami would accompany this impact event, allows us to understand how a large crack in the crust of the earth, would assist in lowering the impact of the resulting tsunami. The result would be the draining of massive amounts of water into the crevice, while at the same time displacing the water into the atmosphere, resulting from the explosive contact with the molten insides of the earth. This would then explain how the remnant of Israel would be saved from drowning in this flood when fleeing to the mountains, at this critical point in time. However, 
This literal interpretation of what we read in God's Word is not a view that we should accept, without supporting and substantiating evidence from the Bible. Having said that, I believe we do then find the support needed for a literal interpretation, when we consider this crack in the crust of the earth, formed at the time of this flood. My argument is this. If the Bible somewhere offers, a literal description of what is described to be the mouth of the earth opening, describing the earth's crust splitting open, positioning this feature close to Israel, while also linking it to the midpoint of Jacob's trouble, we know that the flood that is referred to, also has to be a literal flood. We find this supporting evidence, with connections to both Matthew 24, and Revelation 12, in Zechariah 14. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. It is abundantly clear from this passage, that we have a detailed description of the crust of the earth splitting open, and dividing the Mount of Olives into two sections, moving the two parts into a northerly and southerly direction. This means that the crevice will form from west to east and form a great valley, that would be able to drain away the water of the massive associated tsunami. Note how this passage refers to the remnants escape into the valley of the mountains at this point in time, linking it to Jesus' instruction to the remnant, to flee into the mountains when they see the abomination being set up, and assigning the formation of this crevice, to coincide exactly with the midpoint of Jacob's trouble. Given the direction in which this crevice will form, from west to east, we can conclude that the impact zone will probably be somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean or Mediterranean Sea. So what does this have to do with the abomination that leads to destruction? described in the passages from Daniel and Revelation, and how do we piece this together? I believe that the image that the Antichrist will set up in the Temple of God, will in fact be the final act of rebellion against God, as mentioned in Gabriel's words to Daniel. We specifically see the anointing of the Most Holy in this verse, and this points to the Temple being completed, and Israel restarting the sacrificial ordinances. Anointing of the Most Holy will precede the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist will desecrate the Temple, by sitting in it as God, and showing himself that he is God. This will in my opinion complete the transgression that Gabriel spoke of in Daniel 9 verse 24. The Antichrist's final act of rebellion against the Most High, will unleash the Great Tribulation upon those, that dwell upon the earth, who have chosen to follow the Antichrist who accepted his mark and who worshipped his image. At this point, an asteroid, resulting from the collision between Jupiter and the unseen planetary object, 3.5 years earlier, will strike the Earth with such force, that it will split the crust of the Earth. This tear in the crust will rip through the Mediterranean Sea, into Jerusalem and through the rebuilt temple, destroying it in the process and starting God's uninhibited judgment over Satan, his followers and sin. This asteroid impact zone with the Earth, will be due west of the Mount of Olives when this happens. This event matches a description of what will happen at this point in time, when we study God's Word, applying a literal interpretation. It would also make sense why Yeshua would tell those who will witness the image, being set up in the temple, to flee to the valley of the mountains so that they can get to higher ground and avoid drowning in the massive tsunami that will wipe away Jerusalem, the temple and many of those who will remain in Jerusalem. It is also interesting to note the location of the Mount of Olives, which is situated directly to the east of the Temple Mount. 
It is clear to see that the Temple Mount will also be split in two before it is wiped away by the tsunami. Coming back to Jerusalem and the Temple's destruction in 70 AD, I think you will agree with me that with the few connections that we have discussed up to this point, linking to events occurring around the midpoint of Jacob's trouble, it is very difficult to arrive at a conclusion that would see these prophecies already fulfilled. There is no record of any flood or large crevice in the Earth's crust, occurring during the destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple in 70 AD. How do we deal with the Mount of Olives splitting in two, that is directly linked to the remnant's flight into the mountains as described by Jesus in Matthew 24 and in Revelation 12? In addition to this, we know that John wrote the book of Revelation, around 90 AD, two decades after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. If we then consider the following passages, concerning the timing of the events, that are described to John in the book of Revelation, we read the following. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. These passages, positioned throughout the book of Revelation, confirm that the events described in this book, has a yet future application, from John's viewpoint in 90 AD. If we then assumed, without concern for contradiction, that the events described between these passages in Revelation actually included historic events, this would clearly violate what these three verses state. Any viewpoint or conclusion that results in this type of contradiction, is what I try to avoid at all costs. The only option available to me then, is to conclude that the events surrounding the abomination, set up in the temple, the sacrificial system that will be resumed and ended after 3.5 years, and the Temple and Jerusalem's destruction, are all linked and pointing to a future fulfillment. Remember also that Yeshua, who is Israel's true Messiah, said that Israel would accept a Messiah that will come to them in his own name, while they rejected him who came in his father's name. This prophecy also has a yet future fulfillment, but we know that Israel is expecting their Messiah to be revealed in this year of Jubilee, that started in October of 2016. We see this written in John chapter 5. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. There is so much more to add, but in the interest of time, we will conclude at this point for today. There will be several other videos that will follow to further the understanding of the events that will lead up to, and occur during this period of time. I hope that you found this information illuminating and that it begins to reveal to you the intensity of God's judgment over the earth, when He unleashes His wrath over the wicked. Thank you for watching the fourth installment in this series of God's Roadmap to the End. If you are interested in more information about this, and if you do not want to wait until the next video is made available, please download a free copy of God's Roadmap to the End ebook, which is linked in the section below. You will find a lot more detail in it, that I believe will unlock many mysteries contained in God's Word. If this video is playing in a YouTube channel other than God's Roadmap to the Ends, Please search on YouTube for the name shown in the banner below, all the links that are referred to in this video will be found there. I believe this information was preserved for those who love our Lord Yeshua and who are looking forward, with all their heart, to meeting Him in the clouds. I also believe that God is allowing us to discover His plans for the world in the coming months to be a testimony to those who doubt and to those who will be left behind. Please share this information with as many people as possible. It may be controversial, 
but I believe time will prove that God's word is true and reliable. I also ask that you please pray for me to have more time available, to allocate to this work. Our time on earth is running out and there are so many people remaining to be reached. Please also consider subscribing and liking the video, if you would like to be informed when the next video is made available. Until next time.